Welcome everyone to Michael Chekhov, The NMCA Way, our investigation into the Four Brothers of Art. Today we are focusing on the form and we are Chekhov on your feet focusing. I am Lisa Dalton, president of the National Michael Chekhov Association, and I'm here with... Hi, I'm Will Kilroy, and I am the vice president of the National Michael Chekhov Association. And we're going to dive right in to do an exercise with form. And so very simply, you might be sitting in front of your computer right now, uh, or maybe in front of your phone. So something very easy is to just bring your hand up. And if you were with us last time, I used the hand as a demo. But in looking at your hand, which we would call focal point one in our work, you'll see your hand has a certain form to it. I can change that form, spreading my fingers, making a fist, turning it over but it has a sense of form, and this is a shifting sense of form. And particularly for our purposes as communicators, we want to think about how specific forms will communicate to an audience, or certainly just as communicators in life, what does a certain form communicate out to an audience? So if I fold my arms like this, I'm communicating something because of this certain form. And typically it has a universal message you might determine that this is being closed off, being defensive, being protective. Uh, and then I might have a different form and maybe I bring my arms out in more of a gathering way. And that's a specific form and it's different. And this form for performing is going to change depending on style, which is another one of our elements of the Michael Chekhov technique. So if you're working in restoration comedy, you know, you might sit on the very edge of your chair, just perch. That has a very certain form to it. And if you're working in a contemporary way, you might slouch back and have a different form. And then obviously the props that you handle have form. So I'm going back to my lamp here. This has a very certain form to it, although because it's flexible, I can change the form and then it could become something else if you change the form. So really form is being very aware of items in space, of your own body physically in space, how your body relates to those other items in space, how your body relates to the stage or the room as a whole, and all of that can communicate to the audience or to whoever you're interacting with. So now that I've started that off, I will toss this back to Lisa. Okay, so with the concept of form, what I invite you now to do is change the form of your body in relation to the camera. Take it in some other position than the positions that they have been. And with that, just say, uh, say something. How? Cuckoo. Cuckoo. Okay, I'll go. How? Cuckoo. Uh, okay, how? Okay, I'll go. Ah? Uh, why? Ooh. Okay, I'll why? Go. Here, here. I'll go. Here. Wonderful. Now, say your name. Kristen. Ophir. Will, Will Kilroy. Ophir. Gail Cronauer. Kristen Million. Anne Beck. Beautiful, everyone. Beautiful. And with that little exploration of form and a potential reflection on how all of those affected you. I will invite you for a moment. If you go to your three little dots, you may be able to, uh, on your own, you may be able to hide self view. And what is it like to hide your self view? Uh, this one, we're going to stand. And we're going to find some, something that we can lean on, like a closet or a wall, and just lean on it with your shoulder. A form is an impulse. So if this is my form, 
Now, like Will said, what am I projecting? What am I radiating? So say one word. Lazy. Thoughtful. What's up? Hey there. And we can stand like this with our hands on our chest, behind our, our head. And this is our form. And just zoom out and watch the physical form. And just say a word. Ah, I like nice. It. Relaxed. Oh. Egotistical. So we can see that it's in an impulse. So uh, please sit down. And I want uh, Will just uh, stay on your feet. And we're going to use you, Will, um, for example. So I will give you a physical form. And this is a, an exercise that I learned from somehow David Zinder, and, but I took it to another place. This is the statue. So now I'm going to ask you a question and don't think. What are you? Airplane. What material are you made from? Made of? Metal. What is your color? Silver. What do you see? A vast expanse of forests and lakes. Okay, thank you. So we can just see that in the physical, the physical form is an impulse and we can go on with it. So I'm going to turn it uh, to Gail. All right, so let's build a little bit on some things that Will introduced and I think Ophir as well. So uh, we have the form of the body but we also have the form of whatever we're communicating. So let's think a little bit about how um, form moves from body into speech and body into the emotional life. So if you take your hand, as Will did before, and open it up and expand it, this might be the expanded form of your hand. If you begin to make an easy fist, this might be the contracted form of your hand, right? So you might have a line that has an expanded speaking, feeling, thinking. That same line might have a contracted speaking, thinking, feeling. It might go from contracted to expanded or from expanded to contracted. So the form of the line, the meaning, the feeling, the pitch all might change. So let's begin with this. Expand your hand, easily expanded, and allow yourself to say, ha, whatever comes into your mind. But let it be a line that you can repeat, all right? So my line might be, this is unbelievable, all right? So that might be my expanded line. Right? So would you all take that right now? Allow the expanded open hand to lead and allow the line, this is whatever your line is, to come out in this expanded form, all right? Okay, Lisa, I guess you're playing with the images and sound as you want to, okay? So here's the expanded version of your line, and go. Where is the popcorn? I will take it. I will take it. I'm alive. This is great. I will take it. I'm alive. Where is the now, popcorn? <laughs> now contract it with an easy fist. Now keep the same line. So you have this new form of your hand, but that form is going to move through and affect your entire body. And now let the line come out and be inspired by this contracted hand. The same line. And go. I will take it. This is great. Where is the popcorn? The tool lead. This is 
Where Arnold. is the popcorn? I will take it. Great. I will take it. Where is the popcorn? Great. Now, allow yourself to go from contracted to expanded, all right? And then from expanded to contracted, all right? But we're going to do this as we say the line. So we'll go from contract to expand, allowing the line to come out of that movement, allowing the form of the hand and the line to change. Okay, so here we go, Anne. This. Where is the Right. More lovely and more temperate. I will take you. Now reverse Reverse take it. Now expand it to contract it and I will take it. Where I is it? The to a Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Here is the worthy to a summer's day. I will take it now. I do it over again. I compare thee to a summer's day. Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Where is the popcorn? <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank, thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. It's interesting for me to experience how my face expanded and contracted, even though I was focused on the hand. And working off of Lisa's invitation to be aware of the camera, it's really interesting to experience for me how much changes on the camera as I'm exploring expansion and contraction. Okay, well, without a doubt, I think so far we can see how form impacts us physically and emotionally and psychologically, and it, it, merely in, in how our words come out, how our words are affected by form. Um, but how do, how do other things inform our form? The moments before, how do the moments before inform our form? How do other aspects of Michael Chekhov inform um, our form as well? And I was thinking to myself and I was saying, you know, our qualities and our sensations, how we get to the form, the how, how do we arrive at that form? How does that inform our form? So if we could all find five forms to work with, so it could be anything. You can choose a form that's just your hand. You can do a form with, with your arms like I'm doing right now, but go ahead and find five different forms to explore. So I'll give you a moment to find five forms. I will find mine as well. I'll give you one more moment here. Go just go ahead and review your forms that you've chosen. Okay, good. Let's all go into our first form. Everybody, let's go into our first form, whatever that form is. We're gonna start in our first form. Then, with the quality of caution, we're going to move into our second form and take as long as you like and go. Hold that second form, whatever that is. Imagine what kind of story, where this form could exist in a story. 
in your story or in another story, how it felt to go from one form to another with the quality of caution. Now from the second form, let's move to the, uh, the third form with the quality of mischievousness, being mischief. Ask yourself, what kind of character might have this form and have arrived to this form with mischief? Good. And let's go to our fourth form, and we're going to move to this form joyfully. Joyfully. And go. And imagine a story, imagine your story, where this might occur. Imagine another character's story. The feeling, what kind of character might have this form and have joyfully arrived at this form? And with the quality of, let's do, let's do grief move from four to five with grief and go. Feel it first in your fingers. If you need to feel it small first, you can feel it small and then feel it larger, feel it in other parts of your body. And hold. And imagine, imagine for yourself what kind of character might have this form and have arrived to this form in grief, with the, the feelings of grief, the, the, the qualities and sensations of grief. All right. Great. Thank you very much. So when something is, is happening in a way other than your preference, you ask, where's the beef? and I am now reading from the NMCA handbook. What I want to explore is actually the space that we're in. You're in, I'm in, everybody is in a different space. And I want to start by going back to Ophir's wall. I want you to go to the wall, but find the wall that is facing a window if there is a window in your space. So if you would all go to the wall in your room and face the window. And just think about how far you are from the window, where the wall is in relation to the window. And when you are at the wall and facing the window, I want you to take the energy of this, of this room, you're up against the wall, and you now want to send your spirit out through the window into, for me, it's the street. I want to feel the form of this room with my back against the wall, but I want my spirit to go out the window and to connect with the people outside. Let's actually go to our, our wall and we're going to take the energy in this room and let us send our energy in and a slash through the window. For me, it's a slash. I'm going to take my arms and I'm going to slash the window. I'm going to gather the energy of this isolated room and I'm going to slash through the wall, slash through the window and connect with what is outside. We are going to 
in this one more moment, we are going to liberate our spirit from the inside and we are going to share it with the outside. So gather the energy of this internal moment, this, this interior, and you're going to gather that up and you're going to then through the window and connect with what is outside. We're going to gather up all of this energy and we're going to lift it. And for me, it's through the ceiling and up and out. So assume a, uh, an archetypal gesture. Um, could, it could be gathering, it could be, um, uh, it could be to, uh, to smash, uh, it could be uh, to pierce and see how that, how your energy in that, in that form can transcend the four walls that you're currently in. I'm, this is a complete mashup of what everyone else has done. <laughs> so, okay. All right. Find an archetypal gesture and, and get into it and send that energy right out through the wall. And this time make some sound with it. And this time, this time when you do that, I want you to send it out with, um, with benevolence, with, with, uh, Benevolence and goodwill. Here we go. Oh. 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 And now I oh. want to send that, uh, that same uh, energy oh. out, but this time with the opposite, with malevolence. With malevolence and... Um, Jealousy. And now find find another archetype gesture that you can assume that will that will, that will uh, foster within you a sense of vulnerability. Oh. A quality of vulnerability. Oh. That's where we'll leave it. Uh, when you've done that, are you typically looking for a character type or could an inanimate object as I came up with be fine or everything's perfect as we know, but I'm just curious what your goal would be typically. Okay, when, when uh, we do it uh, with David in class, uh, he, 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 he does it to a character. I mean, you're standing and a person is doing um, from you he sculpture you, okay? So you are a sculptor, and then uh, your partner starts asking leading questions. Um, who are you? I mean, uh, what are you, a man or a woman? Um, uh, what are you wearing? What's on your feet? What's, is, is there something on your head? Um, some jewelries? What are you seeing around you? And, and, it's just streaming, streaming of thoughts and becoming a character. It's, it's like the feeling of form, the feeling of somehow the feeling of the whole, and then the um, in a imaginary body can um, go to life from it. So, yeah, that's the. That's okay. The idea. I did it just just uh, as um, more of a you know 
not a specific form in, in, in not for a character. I just did it for you know, something more. What are you? I asked you. Mm -hmm. Cool. I mean, it makes me think of, and I'm probably we've all done it about the improv where you get into a position with someone and then <laughs> you justify why you're in that position and you let yeah, the thing yeah. go, then yeah, you yeah, freeze yeah. it and you tap mm -hmm. somebody out and somebody has to go take that exact form that the last person was in and then justify why they're in that form and start a whole new scene with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, shooting. I love yeah, that. Shooting. So that's a great improv, I think, with form and justification of form and how yeah. form informs you with what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, high, high, school, high school students loved it. L love it. This. <laughs> I'm going to put that in the book, Lisa, freeze tag under form. <laughs> well, you know, as children, um, we used to play spinning statues. Oh, yeah. And spinning statues absolutely is a feeling of, of the form where you take somebody and you spin them around and then you release them and they wind up in a position and then you tag them and they have to come alive based on whatever is inspired from this form that has been arrived at. So it's a, a very natural, fun game to experience. So I'm gonna slip into a little bit of a formal talk about form and for those people who are really interested in understanding the deeper layers. And I'm gonna jump back to the beef acronym so that we understand we're looking at overall Mr. Chekhov's four brothers of art, the feeling of beauty, the feeling of ease, the feeling of entirety, and the feeling of form, which when you place it in that order spells beef, B-E-E-F. And when we are asking ourselves what's wrong with this situation, we can usually ask where's the beef? And we will discover that we're missing the awareness of some aspect, that we've lost a perception of beauty, that we have found some dis-ease or uneasiness, that we have not uh, experienced a sense of wholeness or entirety. And all three of those, the beauty, the ease, and the feeling of the whole or entirety are about the form. So when we look at the form of something, we are talking about what I call the primary communicating factor. It is the thing that tells us what something is and what it is not. So when we come into the world, we come into the world with the great duh, uh, huh, awe, surprise, the most primal emotional state of awe, wonder, Huh. And in that ha huh state, we are experiencing a form and we don't yet have an opinion about it. We don't know whether we like that form or we don't like that form, whether we have a desire to merge with it called sympathy or a desire to separate ourselves from it called antipathy. And once we uh, identify what something is, that identification process transforms our state of surprise and awe into one of sympathy or antipathy. We want it or we don't want it. We merge closer to it or we separate. You could say we expand toward it or we contract away from it. The form changes once we are informed of what the thing means. So we begin gathering data about forms as an infant. We see, we smell, we touch, we taste, and we hear the objects. And, and everything we do first, first really, uh, our eyes sense something, and if it doesn't hurt our eyes, if the light is not too bright, then the next opinion that we form, that we give shape to, is that sense of smell or touch. If we can smell it before we touch it, then we have a response that we like that or we don't like that. 
and then we touch it and either it hurts or it feels nice. And then we try to eat it and it feels good or it hurts and it tastes bad. So we build up these elements of information that build a database of forms. And as we mature, everything we come to encounter, we first cross-reference with our known forms and our known reaction or response to those forms. And those reactions can be, are originally based on our own senses. And then as we mature, we start to adapt the responses of others around us. We like this form and we don't like that form because our mother likes that form and our father doesn't like that form. And so we start um, Im impersonating and adopting the relationship to forms that those forms around us have. So we mirror the forms around us. And the concept of form is always relative. So this is something that we were, we were exploring in the exercises that uh, being, being close to a wall or being very, very close to the window and the wall would change our experience. Being a, close to a wall and far from the window becomes very different when, we're, when we would be close to the window and to the wall simultaneously those forms would be relevant uh, to each other and the impact that they have. So with keeping that in mind, the concept of form uh, begins to control everything that the performer does. And so the performer is one who transforms, changes forms. And our ultimate service to humanity is to help transform the spectators through our own personal transformation. When we can change our form, we can lead the spectator to also be able to change their form. And of course, all of life is about continuously changing forms. And one of the, so we have the form of our body, which is going to control our careers. Uh, it's going to control our health. And very often it controls our relationships. So if the form of our body is invalid, meaning not valid and invalid, that is going to affect the form of your relationships. You can't travel, you can't go out. Right now we're in an extraordinary social form. Yeah. And the process of being uh, ill or potentially ill the fascinating thing about our current coronavirus is that it can be it can be with you and have no apparent form and then the form it takes when it finally does express itself can be so varied depending on the form that it goes into and how it goes so the question of form is uh, constantly impacting our life and much of our life we spend trying to get our life into the form or shape that we're looking to get it into. And style, of course, is absolutely one of the most uh, crucial elements that relates form to a feeling of truth. So each form or style has its own feeling of truth. And the tempo, the rhythm, the degree of expansion, contraction, all the elements of articulation and precision of staccato, legato, the tempo, the rhythms are all about forms. And having the form that is in harmony with the style creates a feeling of beauty and a feeling of ease and a feeling of entirety. And when some small element is missing. So for example, if we're in that sense of an Edwardian world and we have this form of uprightness, if we lose just the uprightness, we lose the entire form of the style. And 
at bringing that uprightness in, that sense of an expanded upper body is definitely going to help the form of that period have a feeling of wholeness and truth and beauty. And consequently, a feeling of ease for the artist. So those are some of the uh, essential ideas within the feeling of form and why form is so important. It's on so many, many different mm -hmm. levels. Uh, so I wanted to bring that out. Um, Will? I just wanted to say one of the basic elements that relate to form as far as when you're putting on a production, of course, are blocking and yep. choreography. So, you know, you have specific forms on stage, where you move, how you relate to that piece of furniture. Do you sit? Do you lean? You know, how you relate to the props on stage, all of that stage business and all of the blocking. I mean, those are all elements of form. So in explaining it, particularly to a, a younger student, to me, that's an easy way because they relate to that. They know, oh, yes, I have to go and sit now. OK, I've changed my form. I have to stand or as we did, we leaned against the wall. Uh, I have to work with this prop and I have to hold it a certain way. So all of those are elements of form that I think actors can quickly grasp. And then there is more depth to it as far as with what Kristen went over, that there is an emotional and psychological reaction or Gail was working with, then how does that form affect your speech and how text comes forward? So uh, all of that works together. So other thoughts on form, how you've been working with form or questions you have about forms? Anyone want to share some thoughts? I had a few a few exercises um, with incomplete form. And this is very triggering, uh, provocative uh, stuff. I mean, when you know that um, you need to do something and you don't finish it, or you're just about to finish, you're just about to touch, you're just about to, and this triggers a lot of, uh, you said it, uh, uneasiness, and this is mm, very provocative. That gives us some excellent ideas for when we do the episode on feeling of the whole and feeling of entirety, right? So we'll go, mm. through, it'll take us through some of those. We'll experience some of those incomplete forms so we can understand that uh, other brother even more fully. Thank you. Also, any responses to some of the things that you experienced in our little exercising that we did? Any flying back over how you led it or what you experienced when others were leading there? Well, Lisa, I had my, I was gonna share this with, I, what's her, is it Gretchen? No, who was the expand? Gail. What? Gail? Gail? Yeah, I, I was struck by how the the simplicity and how essential those qualities are of the archetypal gestures and that it just was reminding me that those gestures can kind of liberate the mind and and i was thinking about sharing with my students just how to do you know expansion and contraction just so that they can feel what it's like to change form. Uh, may I say something about that? Um, I love working with that uh, when I am uh, introducing beginning actors to uh, simple monologues, which I have to do in an acting one class. Mm -hmm. And um, we will also combine that with triplicity, with a beginning, uh, a middle and an end moment, uh, exploring that. But to have an expanded version of a monologue or three lines, I'll work with the three line monologue because I often have many, many students in class. Uh, a contracted version, contract to expand, expand to contract. That gives them four options, four ways of viewing um, that moment, that monologue. And I keep coming back to that through the entire uh, semester. And um, I, I keep coming back to what Lisa and Will have talked about, expansion contraction being, if you only had one tool, as Mr. Chekhov said, and it were expansion and contraction, you'd have what you need. And 
when I'm working with individual students to be able to talk with them about what happens if you expand at that moment in this part of your body or in your whole body without having to give them any kind of emotionally based note, it's amazing the discoveries they make. So, um, um, I, I mean, I love working with that and that's been very, very powerful. And that's one tool that really seems to stick with, um, especially my beginning students. Oh, wow. Thank you. Wow. It made me think um, a lot of an exercise I give my students when they get their first monologues, which is statues. And I have them take maybe their first five lines of the monologue, but we work one line at a time. And we run, we run around the room, and then I call out an emotion. And they have to make a statue of that emotion and say their line. Mm -hmm. And then they have to do it bigger. And then they have to do it biggest and say the line. And it does a few things. And the first thing it does is it allows that the words to live in the body and for those words to be alive in the body in different ways. And the second thing it does is it really takes the should and it throws it out of the room. I love to say we don't should on ourselves when we do the monologues. We take the should, we throw it out of the room and we make it a could because a line can be said in an infinite number of ways. And by experiencing the words, they understand, you know, that, that acting is everything but the cold hard words, that that the words come out in their own form based on the immediacy of, of the moment and the feeling and the wants and, and the circumstances. So I really do enjoy um, statues and forms. And then the other thing I was thinking of going through this whole process is with everything that has been going on, what new forms are going to be brought to the theater? I was saw online the other day and I, I posted it on Facebook, but it's just this circle of cars and in the middle is the theater. And I've been movement directing Macbeth and I said, oh, how funny would it be if we did Macbeth, right, in theater of the round, but instead of people, it was cars, right? And that I put branches on the hoods of every car. And then when it, when it was time for the wood of Burnham to move, I could have <laughs> inch up to me <laughs> and become an army. Uh, because of looking at you know, the drive-in movies and things that people are thinking about, what new forms you know, what ideas for new forms are going to take shape, um, which is going to also depend on, of course, how long this, this goes on and, and how to teach and how teaching is going to change for a while. So thinking about, thinking about the forms there too. I think that's one of the most um, uh, drastic shifts that's happening for, from, for the theater world, shifting from the form of face-to-face into this online format and the question of how long it will last and ultimately the my sort of gauntlet to the checkoff world is can we by uh working with this online form uh shift the quality of it can we connect with each other directly rather than through the lens but imagine that we can transform the space by connecting with each other geographically in our imaginations and energetically radiating and receiving from each other, not through the lens, the contracting lens, but through the expanding imaginary field. Can we enhance the radiation and the depth of communication that's possible through this form? One thing I want to talk about in shifting is looking at the chart, which is a form itself. It's a representation of, the, of a form of the entire Michael Chekhov technique. And with it, we can look at the many, many different forms. Like each one of the tools is a form. It's a, a form of energy management. Mm. And so we, we, we really dealt with expansion contraction today in the form of that. And we know that that's the pulse of life, how 
all energy is in motion and what is the form of it it is either contracting or expanding. And in fact, when my fingers contract toward each other, they are in some degree expanding away from my face. And when they expand, now they're contracting the distance between my face, right? The fingers expand away from my face and now they contract toward my face. But mm -hmm. from over here, it's uh, the polarity of that. And polarity itself is a form our little our little tpt transformation and polarity and triplicity laws of composition huh. composition is form it is a form so not only are the practical exercises for example the qualities of movement are about the form of the movement but not just the movement of the physical body but the movement of the thoughts, the movement of the emotions, the movement of the will force. So the forms are both physical and psychological or invisible or intangible, as Mr. Chekhov says. And clearly the uh, concept of gesture as which we define as a movement with an intention is a form, right, with a desire, uh, an aim connected to it. So we know that form without aim or intent creates a completely different experience and does or does not transform the being, both the creator of it and the spectator of it. And so when, again, when we move on to the three sisters, we're looking at the form in relation to the laws of gravity. Are we yielding to gravity and falling? Are we struggling with gravity and levity, imbalancing, teetering, or are we free of it floating weightlessly? So the three sister sensations are about the form in relation to these laws of physics, especially the law of gravity. In the three, uh, in the qual regular qualities and sensations, we're very, very much looking at how the form of the physiology, the form of the breath, the form of the quality of movement triggers sensations and how these sensations then transform the emotional life so again it's all about form and the atmosphere happens to be the form of the molecular structure and the vibration the form of the vibration that's in the space and how inhaling that permeates our physical form our psychological form and how the atmosphere itself has an invisible gesture which is it's got its own movement with a form to it that is doing something to us collectively and in the personal atmosphere, doing something to us individually within the larger atmosphere. So those, the distinction between a personal atmosphere and an overall atmosphere is a distinction of form. And then we go on to look at our other concepts, obviously tempo and rhythm are absolutely about strict form, universal form and staccato, legato, lyrical chaos, stillness and speed and how just the changes of those forms alter our experience, emotional, our thinking forces and our, our will forces. Clearly the concepts of characterization when we, especially with NMCA, we understand thinking, feeling, willing, and that a character has a predominance, that that completely alters their physical form. It alters the form of their articulation. It alters their tempo and rhythm. And so again, it alters all the forms through these, uh, and obviously imaginary body and centers very, very directly experiences a form 
and the radiating and receiving is a question of the form of does the energy start from the center and flow outward or does it start from the periphery and flow to the center so we're starting to really understand how every single thing focal points clearly is the form the form of the eyes and how does that form it being in one being in two being in three four or five how do those inform the spectator and how do they inform the artist when they perform with these different focal points so everything is has its relevance and is about the form so when we think of Mr. Chekhov's ultimate statement that all peak performances have instinctively these four brothers of art. It always, we always have a sense of form. Even punk rock, which may seem formless, is a form. Mm -hmm. Chaos is a form. And so understanding that forms are relative, they have laws in them. And those universal laws, when we explore them and develop a feeling of safety in our body for embracing that particular form, that's how these uh, talent. And one of our guiding principles is a question, in what way do you free my talent? So what I've been speaking about is, in what way does the four brothers of art, feeling of form, free my talent. So I hope that's helpful. Any thoughts or responses to that? Great. What can you say after all this? <laughs> <laughs> Great. It's been well, really, really fun. Good. I, I hope this has been helpful and uh, we're going to meet next week and we will do a feeling of beauty mm -hmm. and, um, and we'll follow the same format where we will open with a series of exercises. I so appreciate you guys um, winging it <laughs> and, uh, uh, and just going for it. And uh, please invite other NMCAers that you know to join us. And um, I want to thank you for for sharing and for inviting this Scene from Golden Boy. Uh, we all did the same scene.